Hi, I'm Steve Watson, the Maricopa County School Superintendent, and thank you for joining us for this month's STEM Pro Live. And today we're joined by Leanne Burgess and Adriana Siskel Solberg, who are engineers at the Palo Verde Generating Station. They're going to share with us their role and their work in providing clean energy throughout the Southwest. Hi, I'm Leanne Burgess, and I'm the Reactor Coolant System Engineer at Palo Verde. A Reactor Coolant System Engineer means that I take care of one system in particular, and I make sure that it's healthy and operating normally. So nuclear power is not somewhere I thought I would work when I was a kid. Um, I was really into astronomy and physics when I was a child, and uh, airplanes and uh, space exploration because my dad was a fighter pilot and we moved all over the country for the Marine Corps. Um, but the thing that was very consistent in my life were jets and planes and astronomy. Um, but when I was in high school, I realized that I really liked physics and math. And I had a teacher tell me over and over again that I should go for engineering in college. But I didn't really think that that was for me because I didn't really like to take things apart and put them back together, which is what I thought engineers did. Um, but when I got to college, I tried a couple different majors and I ended up on engineering because I realized that that's where I could put my math and physics love to good use and make a career out of it. Uh, when I was in school, I was in Girl Scouts. Uh, everywhere I lived, there was always Girl Scouts that I could join. Also, Odyssey of the Mind, which was a uh, kind of like a kids engineering program where we did um, challenges and puzzles, that kind of thing, and then competed nationally um, with other kids who were interested in the same engineering and science principles. I graduated from Buena High School in Sierra Vista and then I went to Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff for my uh, college education. I started majoring in physics uh, in college but then I realized what ABET accreditation was and I realized that that was really important if I wanted to have a job that allowed me to be an engineer that I needed to major in an engineering field so I moved into mechanical engineering and I minored in math and physics so I could keep that physics emphasis. I started my career at Palo Verde because when I was in college and in my senior year, I went to a career fair at my university and APS, Arizona Public Service, was there. And I talked to them about my degree and my major and they asked if I had any interest in nuclear power. I didn't really know what nuclear power was. I didn't even really know that Arizona had a nuclear power plant. But as I learned more, I realized that it was a really good opportunity for me to apply my engineering degree into an area where I could contribute a lot to the state of Arizona. Um, so I had an interview and I was hired on the spot. So when I got hired at Palo Verde, the first thing that I did was join the Legacy Engineering Training Program, along with about 20 other engineers that were hired at the same time. We were all fresh out of college, and the purpose of the program was to help us come up to speed with what it means to be a nuclear engineer. Since I graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering, I didn't really know anything about nuclear engineering, which is very unique and specific and has some very um, special requirements. So in the training program, I rotated through the four different areas of engineering, which are design, plant, desi or plant engineering, um, nuclear fuels management, and probabilistic risk assessment. We also did rotations and operations and maintenance and uh, a, a lot of classroom training as well. So now we're at the Palo Verde Energy Education Center where there are some exhibits that will better explain how nuclear power is generated. So let's go inside. The reactor coolant system starts in the reactor which is in the center of the building called containment. Inside the reactor, as you can see, there are 241 fuel assemblies. And inside all of those fuel assemblies are 22 million pellets of uranium-235. Uranium-235 is the nuclear atom that fissions and creates a lot of heat. And that's how we make our electricity, and we need to find a way to carry that heat away. So to do that, we have four reactor coolant pumps that pump water into the bottom of the core, up through that fuel, which is creating all of that heat, and out into our steam generators. Inside the steam generators, that water runs inside of tubes, and on the other side of those tubes are a different water system that turns into steam. So back at the reactor, we have a safety system that sits on top of the reactor head. And this consists of rods that we can insert into the core if we want to turn the reaction off. 
This is kind of like turning down the heat on your stove when you're done boiling water. So after the steam is made in the steam generator, it moves into our four turbines, which all turn one central shaft. So after the steam is done turning the turbines and the electrical generator, it has one more job to do. So it falls into our condensers, where it turns from steam into water droplets. This is kind of like if you had a really cold drink on a hot day, and you get those water droplets that form on the outside of it. So after that steam has been cooled in the condenser, that water needs to be cooled one more time. And this is where you might see Palo Verde from a distance because that steam goes outside to our cooling towers where it meets outside air temperature and becomes water vapor that our fans push out of the top of the cooling towers. On the right conditions, such as a rainy day or a cold day, you actually might see this water vapor turn into clouds. So there are three main processes that are involved in creating nuclear power. The first one I described is how we make this steam uh, by running water over hot nuclear fuel. And then that steam goes out of the containment building and goes down to our turbine, which has a bunch of blades that are kind of like airplane wings. And that steam is so powerful and pressurized that it turns that turbine over and over and over again, which turns a generator. And now you're going to hear from my friend and colleague Adriana about how that generator creates electricity. My name is Adriana Cisco Solberg, and I work for Arizona Public Service Palo Verde Generating Station as an electrical component engineer. Um, like my colleague Leanne mentioned, I am the component engineer for the main generator and transformers, which generate and transmit the electricity produced here out to the grid and to customers across the desert southwest, just like you guys. So being a component engineer means that I am taking care of equipment both in the short term and for the long term. And long term, that means that I get to work on really exciting um, maintenance and design projects, such as replacing components when they're at the end of their life cycle or performing major maintenance tasks. And then in the short term, sometimes um, unexpected events come up like weather and uh, the site would like my help to diagnose and find solutions for immediate problems. Part of making sure that our plant equipment stays really healthy is making sure that we have um, the best equipment for them. And right now, um, even though it doesn't seem like it in Arizona, we use some space heaters to keep lubricating oil warm when compressors and things are not running. So right now we have a system where the heaters that were designed by the vendor um, are not lasting long enough in the very hot heat of Arizona. So I know that sounds a little counterintuitive, but part of our job is to design a new um, circuit that will make sure that these heaters last their intended uh, life cycle. And right here I have um, existing plant information which shows in this circuit right here you have some fuses and some heaters which are shown as resistors on this drawing. And part of my job is that I am going to design a new circuit that takes some of the old and adds in what we call a instrument transformer and that way we can operate our heaters at a much lower voltage and that will lengthen their life cycle and that saves the plant money and it keeps our equipment operating at its optimum. Unlike the power cords that we are so used to using every day that have a plastic insulation on them, conductors that are inside of transformers use paper insulation and then that paper insulation is then saturated with oil. And once the transformer is sealed up in its tank, you can't see inside of it anymore, so we use that oil as a diagnostic tool. Once the paper starts aging, um, or it has degradation due to moisture, the paper starts releasing some of these gases into the oil, which we then use um, gas chromatographs to detect that oil. And some of you might be learning about these columns, or if you're not, haven't learned about those yet, it's something to look forward to in school. But we use the results of those 
um, gas columns or gas chromatographs, and then I'm able to trend that every day. And that trend will give us a good idea of where the transformer is in its life cycle. Part of the every day of my job is performing walk downs, which is a kind of visual inspection that we do of our equipment here. And part of walk downs also includes monitoring of data. And some of the data that I monitor are gases in transformer oils. And that is um, something I look at nearly every day to make sure that we are um, within our limits and those pieces of data can give us a better information or better idea about the aging of some of our components. One of the really fun parts about doing long-term maintenance projects and replacement projects is that sometimes you get to keep um, some of the old parts from the plant. So I have um, in my desk a few um, parts that I was managed to um, hold on to as souvenirs after we've done some major maintenance. So I have connections that go to the um, high voltage power lines that come to your house. So this is one of those connections that bolts on. And then these are parts that were taken from um, some major maintenance work on the main generator. So you can see just how the main generator is made out of all of this solid copper. I went to high school at Dobson High School in Mesa Public Schools, and after I graduated in 2012, I moved to New York. I had never been there before to study electrical and nuclear engineering, and I spent four years there, and I made um, incredible connections, worked in the power lab, and then made the decision to come back and fulfill that dream of working as an electrical engineer at a nuclear power plant here at Palo Verde Generating Station. And part of that is because so many of my friends and family are here and I really have a connection to this home. And the great thing is when I started at Palo Verde, um, they gave me the opportunity to be in a 15 month long training program that allows me to reach beyond just the electrical and nuclear side and learn a lot about other interdisciplinary sciences what other engineers do, and what other types of employees at Palo Verde do, like operators and um, mechanics and electricians, and just go through and learn about a big interdisciplinary team. So when I was about 11 or 12 years old, I had the odd idea that I really wanted to be specifically an electrical engineer at a nuclear power plant. And part of that is because I had the unique experience and opportunity of having a mother who was an electrical power engineer. So um, I heard all of the language and terminology and I sometimes got to go to work with her and see what was up. So I was really inspired to work in this field. Then probably a few years later, I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll be like a fashion photographer, or something in the arts, right? <laughs> something really creative. And so I took an acuity test that our librarian in eighth grade administered to all eighth graders. And it was hundreds and hundreds of questions about what would you rather do, totally unrelated to any career uh, type of field. So, you know, I answered what felt like thousands of questions. And at the very top of the list at the end said, you should work in STEM. And I got, okay, well, that goes back to my original plan, and my original idea. But I didn't give up on any of the creative fields or creative endeavors that I'm involved in. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time doing um, math clubs or any kind of science clubs or field trips. Most of my extracurricular activities throughout grade school were all in the arts. Um, I played. To this day, I played the bassoon with the Arizona Wind Symphony. I was in marching band. I was in the Dobson Symphonic Orchestra. And the arts and being creative has really always stuck with me. But I also had a deep love of math and physics. And I knew that if I had just applied myself and um, you know applied to all the universities with the best programs for me, that I could really do both. And so I did. <laughs> um, 
And part of what I love so much about math is it's this thing that humans have created, its own language to describe the natural universe all around us. And so to me, it's a really creative field and I get to work uh, my creative muscles and creating up new designs and it's uh, really a team endeavor here. Hi, my name is Brian Hoffner. I'm your host for STEM Pro Live, and we're going to transition into the live question and answer portion of the broadcast. So you got to hear a little bit more about what's going on out of Palo Verde, specifically from Leanne and from Adriana. Mm -hmm. But we have some new guests that are joining us here. Uh, and so Miss Holland came and joined us. So Holland, tell us who you are and what do you guys, what do you do at Palo Verde? So uh, I'm Holland Vanderkal. I am the chemical and volume control system engineer. So my job is very similar to Leanne's uh -huh. and my system actually supports her system to make sure the reactor coolant has the water it needs and it's of chemical purity standards. Okay and Leanne I know we got to meet your husband Ryan last year because yeah. uh, mm -hmm. this is nuclear energy week and right. so we did another special last year um, and so now we have a new guest with us. Who's yeah. our new guest? This is our son Jack. Um, so since we both work at the plant we like to think that he's the next generation of nuclear engineer or worker. So, okay. I'm bring him along today. Nice. And I'm guessing he's probably going to end up at the plant. I feel like this is like a legacy that's going on yeah, within the I, family. Yeah, I really here. hope so. It's a great place to work. So, I'd be really happy. So, if mom, dad, there. and son all working at the same plant. Exactly. That sounds like a great story. I think they're going to have to work that in. Yeah. <laughs> so, think, speaking of the legacy program, you guys talked about this when you guys were talking about your journeys and what you're doing at the plant. And I'm just absolutely fascinated by this, this program that you guys have. So d just questions, did you go through the Legacy as well? I did, I was in Adriana's class. Were you really? Okay, yeah. so tell us more about the Legacy program. Like, what is it? <laughs> so Legacy program is a 14 month training program that most of the new engineers to Palo Verde go through. The engineers with previous nuclear experience do not go through the Legacy program. So what do you mean um, with previous nuclear experience? Like they've worked at another plant specifically? They worked at another plant. Okay. Uh, then they do not have to go through the legacy program because they have experience with the regulations and such that we okay. have to use. Mm -hmm. So, you guys want to? Um, yeah, sure. So, <laughs> part of the legacy program is classroom training um, to learn more um, engineering fundamentals. And then, part of the other part of the legacy program is. Um, a lot of networking, meeting other engineers, learning what other engineers do, and then even outside of the engineering field, um, you spend time with operations staff and you meet operators as well as mechanics and electricians and um, maintenance planners. So it's really an interdisciplinary um, training experience so that you meet a lot of new people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I love about it is just you have this, this big picture understanding of what all the different parts are at the plant. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing your job, you're doing it with the mindset of what's happening everywhere else around you. Yeah. I think that's so unique and I don't think everyone always gets that experience of knowing what everyone else is doing that's mm -hmm. kind of supporting their work and their job. So I love that aspect that you guys are going through. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I have a question that's coming in from Ms. Roman's class and their engineering students are t were wondering about the water. So. I know that last year when I got to watch the Discovery Education virtual field trip that was put out, and if you haven't seen that, it's absolutely fascinating. One of the things that they talked about was how critical water is at a nuclear plant. And there's not a lot of really close by water that you guys have access to. Yeah. So you guys came up with this brilliant solution of using recycled water. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Roman's class was asking more about what's ha what do you guys do with the water when it's done? Does it just go right back into our drains or like how, what do you guys do with the water when, when you guys are done using it at the, at the treatment plant? Um, so the water that we use um, gets recycled through our cooling towers um, about 20 to 25 times before the water purity is such that um, it's rejected to what we call uh, evaporating ponds and these are large surface area ponds um, that we've built near the plant and that um, water just evaporates back into you know the natural um, water cycle. Yeah we don't have any sort of runoff anything like that all of the water is very controlled from the minute it arrives at the plant via our water reclamation facility to the minute it's evaporated there's no running off into the desert no washes that kind of thing um, it's all a very controlled process. So. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And I know that um, we kind of got to see in the video a little bit that 
you guys are using water in so many different parts of the process. And one of the ways that we visually see that is in those those cloud flumes that are coming up. Is that is that right? So is that yeah. that part of the water? Is that is that treated water? Is that not treated water? Is that ex contaminated water? Is that clean water? What are we seeing that's coming out of those those flumes there? So that's our circulating water system. Um, that is the final way that we cool down um, the energy that we've gotten from the nuclear fuel. So this is three systems of water later from the fuel. So it's very removed from the nuclear side of things, but. Um, that water gets circulated through the condenser, um, warms up there because it's taking off heat from that steam mm. that's gone through the turbine, and then it goes outside. And the reason that you see it is because um, the water trickles, is pumped up to the top of those cooling towers and trickles down as fans move water, air in a, like a cross pattern. And so when those two things meet, it creates the water vapor. And a lot of times in Arizona, it's really hot and dry, so it doesn't, uh, you can't see it. But if it's cloudy, uh, rainy, or cold, you'll, you'll see some big plumes, and then you can see us from miles away. Yeah, and there, there's no um, radioactive uh, activity in that. It's like Leanne said, it's removed from three uh, closed water cycles from our reactor, and it's just nice pure water. Yep. <laughs> Nice. So I don't have to hold my breath when I see it. No, I, I, I no. It. no. I'm good that way. <laughs> no, it's just like a cloud, just like you said. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we, you guys talked to us a little bit more about what's happening inside and how you guys are using fuel. And you talked about I can't remember the number. It, it popped up. How many fuel pellets are in? Twenty-two million. Twenty-two million. Over twenty-two million in one reactor. And so we have three reactors, so sixty-six million on site. At wow. The same time. Okay. So okay. So you have three different reactors, and they're all just jam-packed with these fuel pellets. So what, what's a fuel pellet look like? I mean, how big is a fuel pellet? Fuel pellet is about the size of a gummy bear. And the pellets themselves are then stacked into the uh, fuel rods. Uh -huh. uh, and there's 241 of those rods per assembly. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, my math is, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to carry over numbers. That's a lot. If you try to do it yourself, you kind of start to scramble the brain a little bit, but there's yeah. a lot of pellets in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so like she said, the size of a gummy bear or even um, the tip of your pinky finger. So they're very small and mm -hmm. they contain a ton of energy. Mm -hmm. So all that energy is packed into this tiny little gummy bear mm -hmm. uh, and you guys have three different systems that are running and I know that uh, you had talked about uh, you're working at an outage and mm -hmm. so what does an outage mean? Does that mean that when I go home my TV's not gonna work? No, so our refueling outages are for exactly that purpose. Um, we shut down our reactor to um, load in a new core, and about one third of that fuel in the core is, or the reactor core is new, and then the other two thirds have gone through previous cycles and are uh, shuffled around. And the while we are refueling, um, we have shut down the rest of the plant so that we can perform major maintenance activities. Um, so right now, one of the major maintenance activities that I'm working on is the um, main generator stator rewind. But um, since these are planned well in advance, every 18 months, um, the transmission system operators um, know well in advance how to adjust the system so that nobody loses any power at their home. And they're also performed during April and October, those two refueling outages per year. Mm -hmm. And that's because that's when electricity demand is the lowest in the year. Yeah. Yeah. So in October, we're starting to come down from the heat. And then April, we're starting to kind of come up from that. So. Yeah, I kicked my air, air down just a little bit on yeah. those Yeah, <laughs> it's nice. That's good. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so I have a question that's come in from Carol Hollerman. And she says, you are all nuclear engineers. I'm interested in being a chemical engineer. Are there opportunities for chemical engineers at Palo Verde? Yeah. So I think actually none of us, well, I have a, a degree in nuclear engineering, but I don't really use it. I'm an electrical engineer, and then you guys are both mechanical? I'm a mechanical, mechanical engineer. But so yeah, you're an electrical engineer, you guys are mechanical engineers, yeah. yes. but you have a nuclear engineering background. I do, um, but this is just to say that there is opportunity for any kind of engineer at Palo Verde. We have civil engineers, chemical engineers. Um, electrical, mechanical, nuclear, um, really any kind of engineer that you want to be, there's um, a place for you at Palo Verde. Chemicals do really well too because they uh, really understand the process of the power plant. Yes, the that's whole totally thing. true. Mm -hmm. All right, so I got a theoretical question for you. Sure. Okay. We're, we're going to have to put on our creative brains right here. And this question is coming from Jonathan Perrone. 
and he wants to know, theoretically, could a small nuclear generator be built on Mars? Oh, I like that one. NASA's working on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, NASA, so hit me with it, Holland. What do we got? NASA's working on a, the kilopower system, uh, which they will probably test on the moon before they go to Mars. Wow. Uh, but generally, in space, they use radioisotope thermal generators, uh, which are completely passive, uh, but they are very... Passive? What do you mean by passive? There are no moving parts. Okay. Right, so you're using plutonium, uh, which is a radioactive source, to generate heat, and then you use the cold of space. Uh, that difference in temperature generates electricity. Uh, but NASA is working on kilopower to have a Stirling engine, it will have a few moving parts, still mostly passive, but generate a lot more electricity than wow. the RTGs. Wow. wow. I didn't know so that. Right. Like so there's some future job opportunities that are <laughs> yes. out there. So if you like to travel <laughs> and you don't mind the cold, there yeah. might be some spots on Mars for you. Travel, yeah. All yes. right, I love it. All right, so uh, Mrs. Lomelli's class has, uh, has a question. They're really focusing on careers, and we kind of briefly touched on what are some of the careers at Palo Verde, but what can students do right now? Whether they're in middle school, whether they're in elementary school, whether they're in high school, maybe they're in college right now. What's something that they could be thinking about and doing right now to start preparing for a job at Palo Verde? So we have a lot of um, education resources available. Um, the Arizona Science Center right now has an exhibit about Palo Verde Generating Station if you want to learn something more specific about I love the plant. The Center. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and also, I think, you know, talking to your teachers and counselors and just staying really engaged is what um, I think helped me. Even when I was in college, um, you know, part of the experience is um, staying really involved with extracurricular activities and expanding your network. And that way, you just have a lot of resources when it comes to making that next step in your career. So that would be my advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would say we to put on a lot of events out at Palo Verde yes. and to try to attend one if mm -hmm. possible. Uh, yeah, you guys have an event tonight. Um, yes. So it's at the Energy, the, excuse me, the Energy Education Center. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys are having a nuclear science community night uh, and that's open to anybody for parents, students, teachers, uh, whoever from the community would like to come out and learn more about what you guys are doing. You guys are going to have all kinds of professionals there. Mm -hmm. You got booths set up, you got food set up. So. Uh, this summer, this is where I met you, we did a teacher yep. tour. Yep. And we did a, a, a teacher day where the teachers got to come out and do this. So I love your guys' engagement. So I didn't mean to jump in, but <laughs> there are so many cool things that you guys are doing that yes. helps the people know what's going on, helps the public know. So, um, And I would just say join as many clubs as you can. Um, there are some really cool clubs coming like that I've heard of, um, like robotics club, STEM club, that kind of thing that I never had the opportunity to join in school, yeah. so I had to find them outside of school. So I would say join those and take those opportunities as much as you can. That's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you ladies for coming in and sharing all the things that you guys are doing at Palo Verde, and yeah. thank you for making my TV work every morning. I really appreciate that. <laughs> and my it's alarm clock and yeah. all those other, my <laughs> phone, everything yeah. else. So thank you guys so much for joining us today for STEM Pro Live. Uh, we're going to be sending out a link to today's broadcast in the next couple days. So again, if you are looking for a drone for your classroom, we're going to be giving two of these away. So take a picture of your class watching this episode or watching the broadcast as we send it out next week and submit that to us on our website. We're going to be drawing two names for two of these drones right here. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next month with STEM Pro Live.